Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to talk about the world's fastest growing and the most insidious religion that you don't know about. <coughs> uh, some people consider Christianity or Islam to be the fastest growing religions. Um, and that might be true. Uh, Christianity, if you go to a country like China, uh, on Sundays you might see some of the roads with jams because of people leaving the churches. But otherwise, organically, Islam is the fastest growing religion. And that as statistics are presented, that is indeed the case. But you can lie with the statistics. Unaware of the nuances, you can be misled. What I want to talk about is the most insidious religion that is wrecking havoc in the West and of course in the third world. It looks actually very cute. This new religion, this mega religion is a very cute looking religion. It's seemingly non-violent. It's mostly innocuous and even kind-hearted and it is proliferating, not because of any conspiracy, not because of any evangelization, but because its growth is a natural outcome of falling away of civilization restraints and ethical conduct. It is a result of entropy. This religion has hollowed out Christianity and it is rapidly finding converts in the Muslim world. So if you go to the Muslim world, you will realize that Islam is getting hollowed out as well because of this new religion that I'm talking about. It's a silent, a silent apostasy that even the fundamentalist Muslims cannot challenge. It is finding converts worldwide even when people formally adhere to their formal religions. What is this religion? What is this fastest growing, most insidious religion? What you have come to know that religion as is wo as wokeism. A belief system of no beliefs, a value system of no values, where there's no objective morality, where everything is relative. If you engage in female genital mutilation, or if you are an and if you are an immigrant, that is perfectly fine. There's no problem with that. For the woke people, you have the right to preserve your culture. Now, I don't necessarily call wokeism as wokeism. I call it feralism or chaosism. And there's a reason behind it, and I'll get into it in a bit. But let's stick with the term woke, wokeism. These woke people have suddenly come to control the institutions in the Western world. They, not, they just don't dominate the institutions, they run the institutions. These people, the woke people, do not understand the concept of classical justice. Their, their ideology is deeply imbued with environmentalism, multiculturalism, diversity, feminism, LGBTQ, affirmative action policies, safe spaces, etc., etc. It is not that I have a problem with any of these issues. But the woke people simply have no concept of the costs associated with these issues. What matters to the woke people is virtue signaling. While they have absolutely no empathy or compassion for anyone. Their materialistic and animalistic desires drive them lacking any moral fabric and I continue to talk about woke people, the feral people, the, the people who believe, believe in chaosism. They have no moral fabric. They have no inhibitions about dipping their hands 
in the pockets of other people. They have no shame in asking for the unearned. Lacking self-responsibility, they always have someone to blame for their real or imagined suffering. Unable to think critically, or think at all actually, they don't want their valueless, hedonistic, animalistic ways to be challenged. These are the woke people. Those who provide a counterpoint to the woke people get what? A fatwa. They, these people get cancelled, removed from the functioning in the society. But worse is to come. Uh, you are, the Western society is in the initial stages of wokeism, feralism. Worse is to come as the cancel culture matures slowly and surely, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. A valueless, amoral society will emerge that will barbarous and savage. And that outcome is inevitable to a society that has lost its civilizational moorings. Now most people, and I'm sure this is a perception that most of you have, think that wokeism is just childish and irresponsible. When you look at Kamala Harris or Trudeau making idiotic statements, you think it's just childish and irresponsible. Uh, and some of you might even think, and a lot of you might have thought, that wokeism might even bring some softness in fundamentalist Islam. What is wrong if wokeism brings, softens uh, the fundamentalist that Islam, of course, engenders? And that is the view you will have until the time you have experienced what wokeism, mature wokeism, feralism, chaosism means. I should know better. I grew up in a feral culture with no values, no morality, no civilizational constraints. In a society where getting away with crime is glorified. Last week uh, in India, uh, in a very well publicized event happened in which a whole bunch of men who had systemically raped Muslim women killed their babies, killed their men, were let go by the government in Gujarat. Now these men were responsible for a program, program against Muslims. Now I'm not going to say that Muslims are any saints, but I'm just talking about this particular incident. About 2,000 Muslims were killed. The person who was the chief minister of Gujarat those days is now the prime minister of India. Now these bunch of people were released from prison last week. And when they came out of the prison, and of course inside the prison they were treated with five-star facilities, they were called good Brahmin. Sweets were distributed. Now, politicians might be stupid, but politicians know one thing. They know how to get votes. This release of these criminals, the most bottom of the barrel people of any society, was a well calculated affair, which is expected to increase the vote count of the ruling party, the BJP. Now these voters are actually, if you met them face to face, they would all look like nice people as woke people usually do. They don't look criminal, they don't look evil, they don't look rapists. But as is the culture of India, these voters have no values. They are amoral people. They overlook the pain that the rapes and killings that had been inflicted on 
the victims. Hannah Arendt rightly invoked the concept of the banality of evil. And remember, when you think about wokeness, which looks very cute, remind yourself of the banality of evil. When the civilizational constraints fall away, and again, I grew up in that society, in a woke society, which has no civilizational constraints, where being a criminal is actually, as long as you get away with it, is celebrated. When the civilizational constraints fall away, what you are left with is savagery and barbarism. Although individually, and I'm sure a lot of you have been to India and other third world countries, individually these people look innocent, very nice, very cute, very friendly. Now those, those of you and a lot, most of you actually have grown up in societies where you are encultured in Ten Commandments, compassion and empathy for other people. You might assume that some of these things are just natural to human beings. Ladies and gentlemen, they are not. Just ask someone from Sub-Saharan Africa or someone from the Indian subcontinent. These values, the Ten Commandment values, the concept of compassion and empathy does not occur naturally to human beings. It came to occur in the West over a long civilizational process that ran for a few millennia. These values, these values of Ten Commandments, these values of compassion and empathy are conspicuous by their absence in the third world. And that includes, of course, Indian subcontinent and sub-Saharan Africa. And this, these concepts are absent, increasingly absent among the wokes, what the people who have come to be known as wokes in the Western society. Again, what I'm warning you is that woke, wokeism looks very innocuous, very cute, very childish. It is not. It is the starting point of what will become savagery and barbarism. Now there is a natural affinity between the wokes of the West and the people of the third world. And that is why the wokes of the West love the people of the third world and they love the third world cultures. Now let's look Imagine a society that has no values, that has no moral code, that has no civilizational constraints. What happens in a society like that? Some libertine might imagine a society that is free, a liberty-oriented society where people can do whatever they intend to do with their personal lives. And I have absolutely no problems with what people do with their personal lives. But unfortunately, civilization requires certain boundaries and certain fences and a moral code of conduct where people's animalistic desires are fenced in, or at least at the very minimal, a civilizational process requires people to ensure that they don't trespass into the personal boundaries of other people. But again, remember, woke people, the feral people, do not understand the concept of boundaries. Now, some of you and a lot of my friends think that woke people are nothing but communists. No, they are not. They are not communists in any sense of the word. These woke people have never, I'm talking about the Western woke people, they have never faced the hardship of life that underpinned communist revolutions. These people, you will find no idealist among the woke people. They might invoke the image of Karl Marx or Lenin or Stalin, but they have no clue what these images mean. They have never read a book in their lives. To avoid a theological discussion here, I will invoke 
the image of the patron saint of the work people. Does anyone know who is the patron saint of the work people? George Floyd. And remember that the communist people would have hanged, drawn, and quartered George Floyd. <clears throat> Not just George Floyd, communists would have actually hanged, quartered, and drawn the woke people as well. And clearly, what I'm conveying to you is that communism looks bad until you start to understand what wokeism means, what federalism means, what chaosism means. Wokeism is the ultimate in no civilization and must lead to a feral existence. Now, I spent a fair bit of my time in Hong Kong. Um, I was attending several conferences. I went, kept on going to Hong Kong, and I absolutely enjoyed the pro-democracy protests that were happening in Hong Kong. Now, these protesters knew fully well that I was a tourist. I had my camera out like a silly person, and I was uh, video recording what was happening on the streets, the fight between the police and the, and the protesters. And I went to tens of those protests. These protesters were perfectly nice people, as people of Hong Kong are, extraordinarily civilized, among the most civilized people you can ever think of. They were well behaved. And in late 19, 2019, I was sitting at the bottom of the China, where the Chinese flag flies outside the government headquarters in Hong Kong. One protester climbed up the pole, took down the flag, and desecrated it. Now, these pro-democracy protesters look nice and cute and perfectly civilized but it was a ship that had got unmoved. And this was going to lead to wokeism. They were people supported by American wokes. Let's go back to another issue, which, was, which probably gave a structure to the Western woke people. In 1960s, when the hippie movement started, Western people led by the Beatles and their guru Mahirshi started romanticizing Indian society. And I can fully understand it in this quiet environment where discipline is respected, where boundaries, there are strict boundaries. When you go to a feral culture, it's a party. It's like going to a nightclub. It's dance and music and it smells everywhere. There was an allure in promiscuity and easy access to drugs that these people of 1960s had. had. Hinduism became a vehicle, became a structure seen as a religion that seemed to offer liberty from the religious constraints of Christianity. But remember, what you experience in a pub after you have had five beers is not the real world. And if you refuse to return back to the real world, there are problems awaiting you. Now, again, I have nothing against uh, either uh, the people of 1960s or the people who, con who participated in Hong Kong protests. But the ultimate consequence of wokeism the mysticism of Indian religions and sub-Saharan pag paganism is barbary and savagery. Let's look at this issue from a different perspective. Economically, communist countries always did better than feral countries. <coughs> feral countries of the third world, the feral countries of the sub Sub Indian, the, the subcontinent of India and uh, sub Saharan Africa. Remember, most people think it's, it's, the problem is with either fundamentalist Islam or communism. 
And I want to convey to you that the real problem, the worst problem, when we become animalistic and feral will be if wokeness continues, and it will. The Western world faces the real devil, wokeism. The third world, which was uh, over the last four, five hundred years, <clears throat> infused with some Christian values, is inevitably going back to its pre-colonial wretched existence because wokeism is rapidly being imported back to the third world. Now, of course, uh, the life is not linear. There's not just one factor in every, any political or religious movement. There's a whole gradations between progressives of the past and the emergent wokeism represented by people like Justin Trudeau, Kamala Harris, etc., etc., or the Supreme Court justice of the US who cannot define the word woman. Why did this wokeism come to exist in the Western society? Uh, my view is that this happened because we upended meritocracy in the Western world. How did we append meritocracy? By choosing our leaders through democracy and handling, handing over the control of our institutions to the lowest common denominator in the society. No wonder our institutions are getting worse and worse. It's only the inertia now that is keeping a lot of things alive in the Western world. So do I, as the wokeism matures in the Western world, do I um, see the West eventually resembling the rest existence of uh, India or sub-Saharan Africa, where the concept of morality, the concept of civilizational values simply do not stick? Not really, because at least they are a critical mass or, or a minimal number of people in the Western society that have some affinity for moral values, something that Sub-Saharan Africa and Indian subcontinent simply does not have. The third world people will clearly, uh, I have absolutely no doubt, doubt about it, will revert back to their pre-colonial, tribal, barbaric, savage existence if they are not already there. In my view, most of them are already there. But the fear is, and this is the problem the West faces today, and I see no remedy that under the influence of wokeism, the West will continue to fall over the next few years, over the next few decades, and there's nothing to redeem it. Thank you very much. So, Johnny, I have a question for you about all the this wokeism that's going around. And um, it's like when I was young, uh, religion was uh, introduced to me, and I just didn't see any logic in that. So I see this wokeism going around, and I don't see any logic in that either. I find it very difficult to understand how so many people can buy into all of this stuff that is absolutely ridiculous. <coughs> None of it makes sense. The not, the, to call a young boy a woman. Like, like it, 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 it's against science, it's against everything, but you have this big mass of people, probably more people than are on that board, on that boat now than are not. How is that possible? How do, how do all these people get convinced with that? It's not just the universities telling them that. There's got to be more to it than that, that it's so prevalent and you know, that train is moving fast. Well, um, I, I, I'm, I'm an elitist uh, in my views about how to approach institutions. You have to have people who are capable of selecting or electing the right rulers, and you have to bring in the right kind of people in your institutions. Um, there is no, sh most people uh, anywhere in the world are not interested in anything except food and sex. That's the only thing that they are interested in. Uh, you have to somehow keep, keep those people out of public policy. 
Um, and that is why, uh, if, I'm, if I was not wrong in understanding uh, some of what uh, Adrian Day, Day said, the English colonizers understood the concept of elitism and they made sure that only a certain class was treated in a certain way, not on the basis of their race, but on the basis of their intellectual capabilities. Uh, unfortunately, with democracy, what you have given power to is the bottom 51% of the population. Mm. Uh, and that is what is creating a massive problem to the Western world. Uh, and the only people I think have protected themselves are people in East Asia. Yes, Amit. Yeah, uh, I have a question. So um, you mentioned like the um, origin of wokeism is in democracy, or you know, that's a root cause. Uh, I'm just trying to find the right words for it. So does it really mean that you know we don't really, we can't really expect things to get better uh, as long as we have democracy? Will will is just um, you know will we see a gradual decline in institutions, um, in our way of life, in overall prosperity? Um, as long as we have democracy? Uh, I, I see absolutely no way out of it. And, uh, you know, even people with conservative and libertarian mindset believe in democracy. They equate democracy with freedom and liberty. Democracy has nothing to do with freedom and liberty. Democracy is mob rule, and that's what we have today. And remember, what happens is that uh, uh, with every passing generation, the quality of people just becomes worse and worse. When you have the initial phase of democracy, you still have people coming out of a capitalist system, entering institutions. But slowly and surely, as you churn through generation by generation through the, those institutions, everything deteriorates. And that's what's happening in Canada as well. Uh, you socialized. Uh, medical system and it has continued to worsen despite that the institution might itself not have changed but the quality of people has become worse and worse with time yeah uh, one more question uh, so for institutions um, you know as democracy gives us leaders of a certain type of I mean, good example was you know I'm not for or against Trump but in 2016 when he was elected there was a fear that he will um, um, cut you know cut down the environmental protections we have and one of the things he did was he he nominated the person to head the EPA the Environmental Protection Agency and you know the thing is we expect institutions to protect us but they are led by people who are appointed by demo, by uh, elected leaders um, so the thing is it's like my question to you is, is like can we rely on institutions to protect us in a democracy or will they also be, uh, or they will they also uh, decline, degenerate, degrade over time? Well, I think every institution must decline with time, uh, but democratic institutions within it, their DNA have this aspect that they will continue to degrade faster than anything else can, because there is no feedback mechanism to put them on track. The, the more poverty increases, the more people will vote for free stuff. So you will have continual degradation in the institutions. Uh, I have a, a comment. Um, uh, first of all, I wanted to mention Hans Hoppe's book, Democracy, The God That Failed. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be relevant to our discussion of democracy. <clears throat> Secondly, um, uh, according to uh, the statistics, Hitler is responsible for 11 million deaths, Stalin for 20 million, and now for 60 million. I'm not sure I got the right numbers, but something like that. Whereas the Wilkesters uh, haven't killed anyone much yet. Uh, 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 Dr. Block, you haven't been to India. You haven't uh, spent much time in sub-Saharan Africa. But continue your question. Well, uh, not so much a question. <laughs> Come yeah. ahead. Um, uh, I, I don't know that uh, the sub-Saharan African or the Indian have killed in the tens of millions yep. yet. And I, I guess I, I don't see them as woke. I see them something different. I see what happens in college campuses and, and on the media more as, as well. Uh, I wanted to say that there isn't just one race. There, there are not 50 million races, but there are at least several. <clears throat> now, my understanding, and I'll be corrected by the doctors here, is that Tay-Sachs disease is a Jewish disease that other people don't have much, whereas sickle cell anemia is a disease 
for uh, black people, mainly. So that's certainly a distinction. And also, uh, whites are better at swimming. You don't see any blacks in the pool in the Olympics in the finals, whereas you don't see any whites on, in the finals in the Olympics in the 100-yard dash or the uh, 200 or anything like that. So I, I think, uh, and there are different IQs of the different races. So to say that there are no distinctions to be made between people, I think is false. Um, uh, I have another comment, and it's sort of the case for pessimism. Uh, and and I, I don't think uh, Victor is going to like this too much. But uh, I think the reason we have uh, wokeism and we have all this um, mishigas, as we say in Yiddish, uh, craziness, is a sociobiological, sociobiological explanation for all of that. We are hardwired for socialism. The reason we only have 50 or 80 people here and not 100,000 or a million in this seminar here is because of sociobiology. Uh, we, a million years ago when we were in the caves or in the trees, we lived in groups of oh, 15 or 20 or 30 or 50 people. Uh, we had explicit cooperation. If you didn't explicitly cooperate, you were kicked out of the group and you didn't leave as many children as if you were in the group. But we had no implicit cooperation. What's implicit cooperation? Markets, uh, uh, free enterprise. I get freshman students and I tell them about um, price gouging and they're appalled. They're just disgusted by it because I think I'm dealing with biology here and trying to convert them in, into understanding the free enterprise. It, their, uh, their hard wiring is all for uh, benevolence and, and um, uh, charity and, and being nice and stuff like that, whereas uh, profiteering and, and taking advantage of other people is just anathema to them. So that would be uh, sort of the case uh, for pessimism. Okay, so Walter, just to uh, respond to your comment on IQ, uh, I have been to close to a hundred countries and I have lived in six or seven countries and I, I've been around the world twice in the last uh, two months. Um, uh, the only time I started to understand why certain places were poor, wretched and backward compared to some other societies was after I read The Bell Curve by Charles Murray. Without an understanding of IQ, you cannot understand anything about human society. Now I understand this is the most politically incorrect thing today, but you are doing no good to the poor people of the world by not understanding the concept of IQ. My maid in India cannot wash the cup properly. I can send her to clean it five times and it will still come back with a thumbprints on, on it. So that is the prop. So, so without understanding IQ, you are getting nowhere in life. You can do virtue signaling, you can look nice, you can just be compassionate, but without doing any good to anyone. Now talking about your first point, which is what harm have the woke people done? The woke people have done tremendous harm to the world. Now. Yes, uh, uh, communism and Nazism killed uh, millions of people. Now remember, when India became uh, so-called independent, because I don't call it independent, it went into the hands of complete brain-dead junkies. Uh, when India became so-called independent, in the, f in the following few years, about four million people died. Four million people died in just the breakup between Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. And that happened within days. Uh, now, uh, look at the populations of those countries. They are, uh, if I'm not wrong, they are close to two, two, uh, two billion people, close to two billion people, 1.7 or 1.8 billion people between Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan. Now, what you have to do is to go there and visit them. 90%, uh, I'm talking minimum, 90% of them live like cockroaches. They would have been better off dead than alive. That's the kind of miserable lives that they have. Now, 
Uh, in in Rwanda, uh, millions of people were murdered by uh, Hutu, between Hutu and Hutu, Hutu and uh, the, the, the Tutu. Within a few weeks, Cambodia killed 25% of its population in a period of, I think, four years. So the problem is that the white people, the European people, are very happy to accept their mistakes. People of uh, natives of Americas or natives of Africa or the in people of sub, uh, Indian subcontinent refuse to look at their mistakes. Turkey is still continues to deny that a genocide happened on Armenians. So because those people are secretive and they will not come out to talk about the crimes that their societies commit does not make them any better than what happened in the West. Now here is the issue. Under Nazis, Nazis did what they did. Things came to an end after a couple of decades. Nothing is coming to an end in the third world, in the Indian subcontinent. It is actually continuing to get worse and it will get completely animalistic in a few years time. Now I told you and I know it will not sink into your soul and I can say the same thing 20 times in front of you. Imagine letting go of rapists and murderers of babies and imagine a society distributing sweets to those rapists. What is the characteristics and culture of that society. That is criminally minded in my view. Imagine being existing in that society and I exist and I have existed in that society. Uh, it is repulsive. It's, it's, you know, and the thing with rapes and killings and prisoners is that these are headline news. So it's easy to talk about it. But these are just the news. What you see on a second to second, minute to minute, moment to moment basis in these countries is continual degradation of your spirit. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the thing is that it's easy to put in numbers the crimes con that was uh, delivered by Nazis. Uh, very difficult to put a number on what's happening in the Indian subcontinent or sub-Saharan Africa or a lot of Latin America. But also because the mainstream media in the Western society would not portray those uh, crimes as crimes. It's uh, if a similar if rapists had been let go in Pakistan, it would have become a new a proper news. But somehow it does not when it, it happens in India because India is a favorite woke country. It's a, it's the biggest democracy in the world. Thank you. To Dr. Block and Jay, and to all of us here, <clears throat> what color or race or religion or gender is your soul? We exist as individual sentient beings, and it's those sentient beings that have values and act on them. To my mind, the principle of wokeism is to conflate identity with the individual, the individual being each of us here who can communicate with each other rationally and have a civilization capable of peaceful uh, discourse and action. The moment we cross over into labeling someone by some characteristic of lady with red hair, does that mean anything? Is it of any significance? Can I make any judgment about you or your gender or your skin color? No, I have to meet you and deal with you. I wouldn't care if you were Jewish. You may be uh, guilty of many of these things that uh, Mr. Raymond talks about. And there is evil in the world, no doubt about it. But the only way to defeat that as libertarians is to deal with it as individuals, not falling into the trap of group identity, which is the very essence of wokeism. There is no doubt that what those evil scum did in India, for which they were given sweets, is evil as individuals. And they should be held accountable as evil individuals. And perhaps we will get back to civilization when we start to render those decisions and act on them and do not excuse membership in any group or identity as an excuse for travesty against those principles. The second point. Sorry. So I, I never said anything against uh, that groups should be blamed for whatever happens in those groups. All I said was that there are 
they behave in a certain way, and these are two different concepts. And uh, that's what uh, Walter Bloch was uh, alluding to, I guess. Uh, when he mentioned IQ, he does not mean that uh, there's no dispersion curve of IQ, of different IQs of people, but there is a certain IQ of certain societies, and he is 100% correct about it. He gave a very good speech on IQ, uh, I think in 2014 at Capitalism and Morality. The video is on, on YouTube. Have a look at it. The I think we have just one uh, quick... Uh, one quick comment then on democracy versus capitalism. Um, nobody wrote the text on capitalism. Socialism, fascism, and communism were all authored as sociological texts and philosophies that could be done. Capitalism was observed by Adam Smith. It is human nature. It is the action of free individuals. And the freer the individual, the more we can derive a civilization based on the right and action of the individual. I think capitalism is the successor to democracy. Mm -hmm. Just, can, I was going to say something in reply, but this lady was trying yeah, to... Yeah, well, uh, she has another qu uh, question there. and the This might be the last question because it's already 3 o'clock. Yeah. You mentioned that wokeism is not communism. My understanding, and I'm happy to be corrected on this, both roots are, have been propagated by the School of Frankfurt. So is there, do you think that there is a correlation between uh, wokeism being the sociological end of communism? Well, uh, I consider uh, uh, um, communism to be a much higher value than wokeism is. Uh, and you understand it if you ex if you have lived and Mike, uh, I don't know if you grew up in India, if you have spent any meaningful time in India. Uh, Mike, by the way, is, is an Indian. Uh, there are few more Indians in this audience, but uh, Mike, once you have lived, and I'm not saying going to India as a tourist, I'm going, I'm talking about going there and operating as a normal guy, working in that society, interacting with people, getting into contracts with people, you start to understand that communism is a much better system than chaosism is. Uh, the problem with chaosism is that, uh, go back to 19, uh, late 1980s. Uh, in late 1980s, uh, Russian uh, GDP, I think, was ab ab about 10 times the GDP of India. Uh, so that's what the difference in chaosism and communism is. Communists at least get a few first order issues right. That there is exploitation, there is, a, there is a way to do wealth creation. Feral people understand absolutely nothing. They, they have absolutely no clue. And what you have to do is to interact with politicians, bureaucrats, general guy on the street in, in India, and you realize, hey, don't they have any is mental structure and your conclusion will be yes they don't have any mental structure there's no discipline in thinking and there's uh, no no moral values By I think we way, can the, the closest I got to working as an ordinary guy in India was Surrey uh, well, <laughs> hang on. So, so Surrey, Mike, Surrey, Surrey, you must remember, is one of the most crime-prone parts of Canada. Uh, and um, uh, you have to have a police state to, uh, to bring criminality of those people down. Uh, when murders happen in Surrey, uh, nothing happens because witnesses don't come out. Mm -hmm. Honor killings happen in Surrey and nothing comes out. And by the way, I'm staying in Surrey currently. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, that is the problem and that is what happens, as Frank Raymond mentioned. You import third world people, you also import third world culture, and that has what Canada has done to itself. I have just one more minute left. Jared, any uh, call to action? Can you end on a positive note? What can we well, uh, I, you know, I, I, I love, uh, I think the Western world has uh, done, um, uh, uh, has killed itself by importing too many people from outside the Western world. And that includes, uh, unfortunately, bringing in too many people from East Europe as well, I think. Uh, they, they should have, they, until the 1960s, the immigration policies of the Western world were restricted for Europeans. 
Uh, there was, and th that does not mean that good people don't exist outside Europe. A lot of very good people exist out of Europe, but there's a probabilistic concept behind restricting it to certain kind of people. Now you can't undo that. America is very rapidly become 50% non-European. There is no redeeming feature in that because democratically, America will go to work in the hands of non-Europeans eventually. Uh, the, the, the positive note that I have to end this with is that um, East Europeans, sorry, East Asians, uh, which is uh, Japanese, Koreans, Singapore, Singaporeans, Hong Kongers, Chinese, have managed their, what I have said, much better than the rest of the world. So that is where the redeeming feature is. Unfortunately, the big problem is that the spring of Western philosophy does not exist in East Asia. East Asians are very good at copying the fruit of Western civilization, but whether that spring will start running through, the, through East Asia, I don't know. But as it stands, uh, my favorite country in the world are in uh, East Asia, particularly Japan.